to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our coverage of HFES 2018. My name is Nick Rome. I'm joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. And with us, we have Nancy Cook who is the Professor of Human Systems Engineering and Director of the Center for Human Artificial Intelligence and Robot Teaming at Arizona State University. I think I got that right. Thanks, Nick. (laughs) Okay, nailed it. So, uh, Nancy, thank you for coming on the show. We're going to be talking about the Past Presidents Forum today and a little bit about your research. I figured, uh, to start off, why don't we catch our listeners up and kind of get them acquainted with uh, how you got to be where you are today. So, How'd you get into human factors? And, and then how did that lead to your, what you're currently researching? That's a very long story, but I'll try to make it quick. <laughs> so I was a, an undergraduate at George Mason University and started out studying foreign languages. And I decided that was not going very well. And then got into um, my first psychology class, which I really enjoyed. Uh, but then I did a little bit of peer counseling. I thought I wanted to be a counselor. And I decided, no, that's not for me either. But I was taking a computer science class, and I really, really liked computer science. So uh, I ended up going to the Career Counseling Center. They threw the Dictionary of Occupational Titles at me and said, look at this. And I put psychology and computer science together and got human factors. And so from then on, I kind of knew what I wanted to do. I took a one-credit course, human factors, at uh, Georgia Mason, went on to graduate school at New Mexico State, and it's uh, been going strong ever since. And then so, um, so what is it that you research now, and how did you, how did you get into that vein of research? Yeah, so I studied, I actually got my PhD as a cognitive psychologist, and, okay. uh, but it's always been applied cognitive psychology, starting with individual knowledge elicitation. I did a lot of work with the fighter pilots, what's the right stuff? Uh, and uh, about 25 years ago now, I guess, Eduardo Salas, uh, who was at the Naval Air Warfare Center at the time, uh, contacted me and said, hey, some of the decision-making and cognitive stuff that's going on in our TADMIS program, this is related to the Vincennes incident where we accidentally shot down an Iranian Airbus by making uh, some bad team decisions. He he said, well, we need some cognitive psychology help on this, go beyond industrial organizational psychology. And so I started getting involved in teams, and I've been doing teamwork and team cognition kinds of research ever since. And most recently, my team's contain artificial intelligence and robotic entities as well. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Like, how did that get introduced into what you're doing? Because, like, human and, like, the robot interaction, that's something that's not relatively new, but now we're introducing, like, the element of artificial intelligence into it. How did all that come about? Yeah, well, it it turns out that artificial intelligence is uh, advancing. Our robots are getting smarter. uh, And eventually we predict that they'll be able to work alongside people as full-fledged teammates. We were doing some research in our lab um, about that. Uh, the, the, really, the change here is going from supervisory control of a machine or a robot to actually teaming with them. So we have one setup in our lab that's for unmanned aerial vehicle ground control, where we had been running teams of three people in the lab. There's a, a photographer, a pilot, and a navigator, all controlling a single vehicle. And now we've introduced an intelligent agent into the loop who's the pilot. And that's an agent that's developed by the Air Force Research Lab using the ACTAR cognitive modeling language. And we look at how that agent works as part of a team uh, and compare that to all human teams. And I'll just stop by saying it's pretty good, but not as good as a person. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. I mean, I'd imagine that the transition from... um, the supervisory control where you're monitoring a system to actually uh, sort of giving that full feedback and receiving feedback from an artificial system can be quite challenging, right? Well, well, yeah. So when you're interacting with a, an agent like that as a teammate, you need to do things like trust, trust it. You need yeah. to be able to maintain situation awareness when it might be doing things that you're not so sure of. Its biggest problem right now is that it doesn't anticipate the information needs of its fellow teammates. So it's a very selfish teammate right at the moment. They're working on improving it. But as a result, what's really interesting is that the human teammates start being selfish too. They sort of emulate this synthetic agent and brings the whole team down. And so no one's Hmm. anticipating needs of other teammates. They're all kind of on their own. 
That's very interesting because I would expect that they would almost rely more heavily on each other versus like emulating what the the AI system itself is doing, and that's cr- that's pretty crazy to hear that that's yeah. really impacting their dynamics. Yeah, so we call it entrainment. So they're kind of modeling their behavior after this synthetic agent. So one synthetic agent can bring down the whole team. When we put a really good uh, person in the loop instead of the synthetic agent who helps to push and pull information across the team, that brings the whole team up. So it can work both ways. So I guess is the is the challenge right now sort of the transition piece from these two different roles of interacting with an agent versus a supervisory level, or is it more trying to figure out what works in the partnership role? I think it's all of the above. So deciding what kind of role should, should robots or these synthetic agents have, uh, I don't think that we necessarily want to duplicate what humans do and have them do our jobs. We want them to do the things that are all dirty and dangerous that we don't want to do, uh, but have them work with us as, as teammates. So we're building a, a, a lab that's a battlefield simulation where you might have the robot go out and detonate an improvised explosive device or go carry something really heavy from point A to point B, and the person's doing a lot of the cognitive work that the agent maybe can't do. Okay. I, I want to move into the um, Past Presidents Forum. So that's another reason why you're here at HFES. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, both Blake and myself weren't able to attend that. Uh, so maybe just kind of generally, what is it and what's the purpose of it? So the Past Presidents Forum is just an annual event at HFES, uh, the annual meeting. So the person who is the immediate past president uh, designs whatever it is they want to design. Uh, Last year, um, in my presidential address, I laid out three things that need to be done if we want human factors to help solve societal problems, very big societal problems like uh, climate change, for instance. And um, what we have to do are three things. We take a problem-centric approach, so focus intensely on a problem, take a systems view of the world, and also work collaboratively with people in other disciplines. That's essential. And so that third piece is what the past President's Forum was about. It's about interdisciplinary collaboration, human factors, people, and others as well. Uh, I had, uh, I'm really proud of my all-star lineup that I had for this <laughs> panel. We had uh, Eduardo Salas there. Each of these people I've also collaborated with, Cody Gonzalez, Ron Boring from Idaho National Labs, uh, Micah Ensley, and one other person. Who am I forgetting? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm that's okay. Oh, 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 Emily Roth. <laughs> there you go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but they were great. Great. So I, I guess um, the purpose of the forum uh, informed me. I'm, I'm not... What, what is the purpose of the forum, I guess? Uh, I think it's, it's to provide a forum for the president to do whatever, past president to do whatever it is they think is important to do. And so I thought it was important to have a panel on this topic. And so I asked each individual on the panel to talk about their experience working across disciplines and the challenges and lessons learned. Okay. Is there um, any sort of output from this meeting, like a summary or some sort of uh, next step actions that come out of these things? Like, how, how does that all go down? Well, not, not typically. So the panel sessions here at the annual meeting don't tend to have as much in the proceedings as some of the other uh, sessions, like the lecture sessions. They have proceedings papers. Panels don't. Sure. When I go to this meeting, I tend to go to the panels because it's the only place you're going to get it, really. And these are just ideas that are coming off people's heads in real time. And so you can jot down notes, and that would be the best we can do. You know, I think it's maybe a good idea something should come of this, and, and we could do that sort of independently. Yeah, I, that'd be a good idea, I think. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, you don't want to lose all that great information that's coming off, because even if it's stuff that's coming off the top of your head, I mean, having a full panel to help you discuss and almost work through it is really important. But were there any kind of, like, themes related to the challenges you guys faced in terms of, like, working, collaborating in a cross-functional domain? Yeah, there are a couple of themes. One of them is the uh, theme that we that is near and dear to all our hearts here that we've been discussing for years and years, which is uh, we have no soul, no one knows who we are, human <laughs> factors. We uh, no, we have no identity. No one appreciates our value. Are you well, kidding me? No well, one well, has well. that perception of us. <laughs> <laughs> 
But I, and, and you know, and so that's maybe the first challenge when you go to work across disciplines, people knowing what you do. And I think that the best solution to that is just dive right in there and do it and, and show people uh, by doing what we do, show them the value. And so I've been working across disciplines and I, they learn by what it is that we do. Right. I mean, one sort of common thread that keeps coming up is how do we communicate to others that are outside of our discipline? How can we communicate exactly what we do? Um, it, was there any talk about communication in oh, this? Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, that's a big problem because across disciplines, we speak a different language. We might use the same words. I gave an example in the forum about the word experiment. I was working with an engineer, um, a civil engineer, actually, and uh, we were working on a project together, and he came into my uh, lab and said, I'm going to run the experiment today in your lab. And I said, today, because my experiment, and I said, so you're going to start today. He said, no, we're going to do it today. I said, well, my experiments take like a year to collect data. I don't know how you're going to do it in one day. Well, after much discussion, I come to find out that he uses the word experiment differently. He meant a demonstration of technology that they developed. Gotcha. So once I figured that out, right. we, had, we were able to talk. So, and there's words like model that people use uh, in many different ways. So the first step in working across disciplines is figuring out where you're coming from. Yeah, and then sort of how do you, like what language do you use once you have found sort of this common ground? Like you, you mentioned the experiment example, but you both can't use that word going forward without sort of that knowledge of how the other uses it. Is there like a third word that you would use to kind of, uh, or, or is there a replacement word that either of you would use in that situation to help communicate effectively? I, I think as long as you understand that we have different, we mean different things by that same word. Once you come to that kind of understanding and agreement, then you can uh, keep going, forge ahead. The problem is when people keep going and don't realize that there's that um, misalignment and things can really start breaking down when uh, you're like, that's, that wasn't an experiment. <laughs> what was that? And, and so you could start insulting the other discipline in, in some cases. And, and so it's just, I think, important to try to lay all of your conceptual groundwork out on the table. And that's really hard to do because these are disciplines that people have received PhDs in. And it's not like I'm going to learn everything about civil engineering either. Right. But, it, but in terms of the project, we should try to discuss it in the beginning uh, and what we're going to do and who's going to do what. Uh, sometimes in, look, in team science, they call that a scientific prenuptial agreement. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great term for it. It really is. Because, I mean, we've run into that problem in our own lines of work, right? Like defining what a prototype really means and what that means when you deliver it is very different from like a human factor psychology point of view versus what an engineer is expecting you to give them. Right. So it's, it's, it's very hard, and I can't agree more. You have to really define all of these terms and how you're actually going to use them yeah. in order to be successful, not in just the end product, but just interacting with each other. Right. So, Nancy, I know we're running up here a little bit on time, um, but before we go, I want to ask you a couple questions. So a lot of our listeners might be looking for advice in the field. What is one piece of advice that you wish you knew when you first started out in the field of human factors? Well, one piece of advice, I think uh, as far as this organization goes, I really believe what uh, many people said in the plenary today, including Debbie Bum Davis, that volunteer, volunteer as much as you can, get connected with people that way, um, join uh, committees and organizations, uh, connect with people, because that network is, is key to success. That's some great advice. So one last question. Uh, if our listeners like what they hear and want to find out more, where can they go and find you or follow your work? Uh, they can find me on the Arizona State University website. Uh, just uh, Google me, look me up. I have a faculty website and also the Center for Human Artificial Intelligence and Robot Teaming has a website. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, and we'll make sure to put those in the show notes as well. Well, that's it for now. Nancy, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking with us about the Past Presidents Forum and your research. We really appreciate it. The way we like to end the show is we say it depends because obviously everything in the just kind of depends on the human. So I'll count us down. So three, two, one. It, it depends. depends.